morning, ladies and gentlemen, for this special event as we have assembled here to celebrate the 153rd birthday. I wonder whether I am the right and qualified man appropriate enough to speak on Mr. Gandhi on this auspicious occasion. This arguably most famous son of the southern subcontinent of India is undoubtedly the global father of non-violence. This thinker and philosopher is more relevant than ever to our world and the United Nations, has been absolutely right in declaring the anniversary of his birth, 2nd October, as the International Day of Nonviolence. Truth and nonviolence had shaped Gandhi into being a gentleman who practiced reconciliation and forgiveness. In this regard, he is on record as having said, and I quote, the law of retaliation has been tried since the day of Adam, and we know from experience that it has hopelessly failed. We are groaning under its poisonous effect and close quote. Gandhi's continued relevance is lodged in the second area, and it relates to the virtue of living a simple life. The sad reality is that today's world is moving in a direction that is diametrically opposed to Gandhian ideals. For instance, the world economy is based on consumerism, greed for profit, and a lot of wastage lies in its wake. These have led to over-exploitation of natural resources, environmental pollution, and climatic changes with disastrous consequences to our future generations. And there is a third area of Gandhi's relevance, and this relates to social stratification issues. He was a great cosmopolitan and was not averse to making references to luminary, luminaries such as Buddha, Jesus and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as well as to thinkers and philosophers such as Tolstoy, Narisana, Metta and Anna Kingsford. In the late 19th and early 20th century, Freedom and democracy became the past concepts which tended to be overused by certain politicians. But Gandhi was about politics. His chief concern was to enlighten the minds of the people and create a better society for everyone. This was what he said of politics. And I quote, politics has divided India into Hindus and Muslims. I want to rescue people from the quagmire and make them work on solid ground where people are people. Therefore, my appeal here is not to the Muslims as Muslims, not to Hindus as Hindus, but to ordinary human beings who have to keep their villages clean, to build schools for their children, and take many other steps so that they can make life better and close coat. The test of sincerity was in the burden of sin that Gandhi carried on himself. When communal violence could not be checked, Gandhi would go on a fast, and this put his life at stake. He bore the sorrows of the world on his frail body in order for the people to come together 
in peace and harmony. Instead of sowing seeds of division for personal advancement, he was a man who struggled to bring everyone together. It was his commitment to his higher nature and his creator. Besides politics, there are citadels of prejudice and entrenched interests that prevent people from coming together. Gandhi tried to abolish the ancient system of untouchability for which he earned much hostility and abuse from orthodox circles who tried to assassinate him in several instances, such as in Pune in 1934. At the same time, he drew flick from certain quarters who chastised him for not doing enough for the downtrodden castes. The critics failed to understand that Gandhi believed in gradualism. His strategy was to bring an end to untouchability, untouchability as the first step. In his words, and I quote, if untouchability goes, the caste system goes, close quote. It's a well-noted characteristic of Gandhi that during a religious strife in Bengal in 1946, he walked from village to village, conducting talks, reciting prayers for unity, and quoting passages from various scriptures, including the Quran, Bhagavad Gita, and Gospel. He spoke about what religion should mean to the villagers. He wanted them to reject superstitions and embrace reason. He spoke about keeping the mind and soul open and allowing fresh wind to blow from all directions. For him, religion must encompass love and compassion. Be that as he may, it should be clarified that Gandhi never claimed finality for his ideas. Indeed, he was constantly developing and outgrowing his own ideas. It was not difficult to confront him with his earlier views, and he would admit that he was then merely a young man in his formative years. But Gandhi evolved over time, just as we do at the various stages of our lives. Gandhi was known to have expressed the idea that a man matured over time and his earlier ideas could have been nurtured while he was a young man whose maturity may not have been fully developed. At this juncture, permit me to draw your attention a 1919 pledge that Gandhi had wanted the Hindus and Muslims to collectively take. It goes like this, and I quote, With God as witness, we Hindus and Muhammadans declare that we shall behave towards one another as children of the same parents, that we shall have no differences that the sorrow of each will be the sorrows of the other, and that each shall help the other in removing them. We shall respect each other's religion and religious feelings, and shall not stand in the way of our respective religious practices. We shall always refrain from violence to each other in the name of religion. Close quote. What Gandhi had asked of the Muslims and the Hindus is as relevant today as it was in 1919. It is as relevant for us in Malaysia as it is in India. Despite the vow, India witnessed the worst riots, especially in the years just before independence and its aftermath. 
During the last year of his life, Gandhi began a fast unto death in Calcutta, Delhi, to quell sectarian violence that was raging unabated. He fasted as a way of persuading the warring hordes of Hindus and Muslims to lay down their weapons and make peace with each other. The frail old man, more popularly known as the half-naked fakir, by force of moral example, restored peace in two very large cities. Gandhi was then getting ready to go to Punjab, where the rioting was uncontrollable. Tragically, before he could get there, Gandhi was on 30th December 1948, shot dead while walking to an evening prayer meeting. Gandhi's death brought an anguished comment from late Jawaharlal Nehru. The then Indian Prime Minister said, and I quote, a light has gone out of our lives and everywhere there is darkness. About a million people across race, caste and religion walked in his funeral procession. Gandhi belongs to the ages. He continues to fascinate legions of scholars, writers, journalists, biographers, historians, political analysts, and even freelancers traveling in India. As the News Chronicle reported from London, and I quote, a light on the earth has been quenched, but a star has been lit that will illuminate the universe and the ages. And I close quote. Let us all believe that the guiding light of the great Mahatma will lead our nations, including Malaysia, India, and the rest of the world to usher in a great world civilization based on unity, love, justice, and compassion. Thank you.